External Affairs is David Close, and he's coming to join us today to present the Tamboran story. Will you please make him very welcome? Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us. I haven't worn my feathered outfits. Um, maybe next time, that's a good idea. Um, so I've got about 15 minutes to talk you through a little bit about the Tamboran story. So uh, hopefully we'll keep it interesting and move things along. Um, if I can make my clicker, there we go. A little bit of a disclaimer, there will be forward looking statements. The nature of exploration is uncertain, of course. These are the predictions and forecasts we're making today. And I'll talk a little bit I got the slide, about, um, about the Beetaloo and, and who we are and give a really high level summary of the company. So Tamboran, as, uh, as you've just heard, is a, a company focused on natural gas exploration, bringing new natural gas to market. Um, very much part of the energy transition story. For that to be an orderly process in Australia, we need gas to underpin that transition. And, and the East Coast hasn't had new supply come on for some time. A lot of the resources are committed to contracts already, and we've got other mature fields in decline. So gas as part of that transition story is critical, and, and, and there's a relatively few number of companies working on a relatively few number of projects that can materially move the needle. And that's where, and that's where we really see the niche for Tambran to grow from the company we are today into a major player in the gas space. So we're very focused on the Beetaloo. We're a pure play Beetaloo gas player. So if you like the uh, exposure to that upside that a resource like the Beetaloo gives, which is a huge resource. And if, if there's two messages that I, I'd ask you to take away, it's really around that story about gas and the future of gas and the story about growth and running room and upside that Tamran offers in spades. We'll talk a little bit more about the Beetaloo as we go forward here, but we think it's got the potential to be a really high quality, low supply cost hub that's flexible to supply both East Coast demand or go out of Northern Australia through existing infrastructure. You'll see if I can get my laser to work, the Beetaloo sub basin is here in the central part of Northern Northern Territory. So we're about six or seven south, hours south of Darwin. Um, we're on the Stewart Highway, we're on the Carpentaria Highway relatively close to the Amadeus gas pipeline and the Northern gas pipeline that gets you into the East Coast gas network. So despite looking remote, it's relatively well serviced in terms of infrastructure, which, uh, which is important. It's a little bit about who we are, but I won't go through any detail here. This is on our website. And uh, I think this was released to the market yesterday. So if you want to go through any of the details about the uh, listing and the performance over the last 12 months, please um, I'll leave that there to, to glance at. Listed last July, and I think what's really important is that is the board of directors that uh, has been pulled together to support Tamra. And there is not a more focused, upstream, ready, and relevant group uh, of directors available for a small uh, explorer, junior explorer like ours. Um, the, the chairman, Dick Steinberger, Dick Steinberger, was a very important part of the growth story at Petrahawk. Fred Barrett, former CEO of Barrett Brothers, um, and Pat Elliott, uh, one of the founders of Eastern Star Gas. And we've got a number of other uh, ex very experienced board members, both in the US and, and, and Theomont, very experienced in Australia as well. So I think it's really worth emphasizing the importance of that board. And also just that they uh, are major shareholders, board and management are major shareholders, and we're pretty tightly held. And that's part of the reason here, helping spread sort of the message about Tambran as a, as a, as a growth opportunity for investors. So the vision really is to, to grow from where we are as an explorer today, but very quickly move to a value proposition around production. Um, we see the markets being huge north of Australia. Darwin is advantageously placed for the biggest population centres on the planet that are energy hungry, going through that development phase where they need more gas, particularly as they try and retire coal. So gas is a huge story. We already know that LNG out of Australia with a second, uh, we fluctuate between the first and third largest exporter of LNG already. And we see the opportunity for growth, particularly as Russia comes out of the market over the foreseeable future, opportunities for projects like this in stable countries with you know, dependable regimes becomes more and more important. So in the near term, what does that look like to that growth path? Well, it's, it's about adding resources in 2023, getting the 2C, getting the contingent resource on the books and then transforming that into reserves through gas sales agreements and pipeline agreements and so forth. So you can sanction a project and get that production going into the East Coast. Ramping that up to a project that's about 100 million scuffs a day, which is a pretty sizable project, but really the scale here and the, and the value comes from that BCF a day type, that really large LNG scale and getting into one of the export markets through either the East Coast out of Curtis Islands or out of Darwin. Sorry, yeah. 
slow response there. My thumb's not working. Um, so we talked a little bit about scale and that's what you need for LNG and really what the globe is going to need uh, under all reasonable scenarios about how we get to a net zero 2050 type of aspiration, which the developing world are still working on how to commit to that and how to get to that. And even under that net zero scenario, there is a large amount of gas production, a similar amounts to 2019. We need to make things like CCS work or other, other methods of, uh, of uh, decarbonizing that gas supply because it doesn't go away. And every year between now and then, there's about $600 billion assumed to be spent on gas developments under that net zero scenario that the IEA published. It's got a lot of attention. So it's not that gas is going away in any way, shape or form. And Australia needs to do its share of heavy lifting and contribute to that transition story and the provision of gas. We can't just leave it up to OPEC, leave it up to Russia to do all that heavy lifting. And we see the risks in that, you know, playing out very real time at the moment. So we see you know, that demand growing over the near term and then maintaining at a pretty high level that will, will require new projects to be sanctioned. Uh, we sit on a very large resource, you know, 19 TCF, a prospective resource that we think we can convert um, over time into, that, into the reserves and the production that we need to backfill that. And so what does that look like though well, in terms of a supply stack? What really matters is can you be competitive on a global supply stack? So where, which projects will fill that demand? And it is globally competitive and you must be competitive with your, your cost of supply. We, we believe based on you know, analogs and metrics that are comparable to the US and that we'll, we'll see in a success case and, that, and we'll talk a little bit about the rock properties in a minute and why we think this is a very reasonable proposition that we can be right down the low end of that, of that cost curve and prevent, potentially providing gas into Asia at globally competitive prices, which is what we need for that for that sales to, um, to really ramp up. Because there is a lot of gas projects out there in the world, but not all of them will be sanctionable for various reasons, geopolitical risk, geography, and or economics. So there's a huge opportunity for us, um, you know, to prove up the world-class quality of the resource and move forward into that, that phase of the project. So for the geologists, I know there's a few geologists in the room. I've met a few over the last couple of days, which is um, always exciting to meet fellow geologists. Um, at least one map, had to throw one map in there. So this is a map of the Beedaloo shooting in on the, um, the Bell Kerry Shale is the name of the formation that contains the gas out here. You may, have, may not have heard of that before, but you may have. The Bell Kerry will be hopefully a more, um, you know, a name that everybody knows going forward if we get production out of it. And what we see is two, two areas of really, uh, you know, prime interest and, and, and what we talk about the core Beedaloo, that deep part of the Eastern sub basin there, where we see the really similar properties and depth profile to say something like the Marcella Shale in the US. Um, we can see that we've got interest in two projects, both in EP161, which is a project that Santos operate, obviously a major, US, uh, major Australian gas uh, explorer and producer. And then our next door, so that's this project is operated by Santos and we have a 25% interest. And this project is 100% uh, Tambaran and we're the operators. We control our own destiny, which is very important for, um, for our listing and for our company. Uh, you can see the volumes in the table there. I think really what I'd focus on is the scale of the upside. Although the current contingent resource is somewhat modest, the net prospective resource there is you know, greater than 10 TCF in both areas. So it's a really substantial volume of gas that you don't hear about much in the East Coast market because we've got mature basins that are largely explored and, and developed. Just to give you a bit of an idea of scale, because it, you know, it can be hard to get a reference point. So we've, we've got a great map here on the right showing the Eagleford trend. So this is South Texas. Uh, from the Mexican, Mexican border, sort of following the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see the red to green is a dry gas trend up to an oil trend, very heavily developed over the last 10 years. And it's been an amazing play for a number of players in the US. Now, geologically, not necessarily the same type of play. It would be more akin to the Marcellus, but it does give you an idea that there's multiple ways for these shale plays to work. You can be an Eagleford type rock, which is more carbonate rich for the geos out there versus the Marcellus, which is a very siliciclastic rock. The point is the scale here. And you can see that our acreage position across EP161 and EP136 would be the biggest position of any single interest holder in the Eagleford if it was held across the Eagle. So it is a material position. I won't go into the spidergram on the left, but if you've got any questions, you want to kind of talk about that. I'm at the booth after the presentation today. And really what it demonstrates is that we have these world-class static properties. So the log and core data analyze the date, put us up there with some of those top quartile plays. We're going to prove it with flow tests and dynamic data, but the static data are really positive, and that's um, you know, that's all you can ask for at this at this point. I should point out there have been 
you know, horizontals dual to date that have been really encouraging. And we're really looking to capitalize that this year with our uh, Maverick One well that's going to drill in 2022. So that will be a real uh, pivotal point and it's really a well to watch for Tamaran and really for the broader gas industry in Australia. I'll come to that a little bit more on the next slide, actually. So this is, you know, a little, a little bit of detail, but for those of you who want to see the, you know, the, the blood and feather behind the plan here, this is how you go from where we are today to potentially at the back end of 23, being able to sign gas sales agreements, move towards project sanctions, get pipeline construction underway so that you can move gas to market and get that pilot project of 100 TJs a day up and running, which we see is a really important step. So by the end of 2023, the contingent resource position could be over a TCF, which is again, a really material volume of gas that will give you over a you know, decade of supporting an LNG project or even longer supplying that volume um, into the domestic market at that rate. So that's the target in the near term. Maverick One is obviously the key catalyst um, for the next step. And, we'll, and that'll be, like I said, a well to watch. And Maverick One is here in the north of EP136. And we've already started civils on that. We're doing the preparatory work, drilling water bores and so forth. And so that's progressing um, as we speak. Not drilling the well yet, but we're progressing plans to bring the rig on. And um, we've confirmed the rig and released that to market. So what does that look like in terms of value? It's, it is hard to get look-throughs that are analogous to this type of play with so much running room, so much upside. Um, but Chris from our IR team has pulled this slide together. This is a bit of an idea of where we are today, very much down the bottom left-hand you know, quadrant, very much a risked outcome. But as soon as you get one or two successful wells, the opportunity to move up between, say, Wavesia, which is largely an exploration project still at this point, but obviously some great prospect and it's a very high quality resource, or the recent um, takeover of Senex by POSCO sets a bit of a metric. So to give an idea of the growth trajectory, I think this is a helpful chart to, again, just give the idea that the growth in a success case is going to be really material. And so what does that look like in terms of economics and development costs? I won't spend too much time on this. I'll, I'll, I'll maybe draw your attention to the map on the left and just talk about the, the routes to market. You can see the price estimates or the cost estimates there on the, on the right. Um, but really what we, what we see as being critical is being able to supply gas to the East Coast where there's going to be demand and increasing demand potentially as coal comes out of, um, comes out of the market. And then there is LNG export capacity on the East Coast forecast, particularly out in the later part of this decade and, in, and then beyond. And Darwin as well, we see, you know, ICTHIS uh, or INPEX announcing their ambition to build a third train uh, at their project in, in Darwin. And we know Santos have talked about expanding their DLNG project as well. They didn't come in to, to keep it as a one train project. So there's a lot of expansion around us sitting on a high quality gas resource set you up for success. And that's very much, and, and the types of the supply costs we talked about before puts us right square in the, you know, that competitive range that's critical. Is it the one minute, two minute, great. I will meet that. So the couple of wells that have been drilled um, last year by our, the operator on EP161, Tanamarini 2 and 3, uh, good technical proof of concept. What we really need to do is show the scale up from that type of exploration mindset to a more appraisal and development scale mindset. And so you'll see our wells over the next couple of years start to prove, you know, provide proof of the upside when you do start to implement that best in class technology from North America and the intensity we'd expect from North America. The environmental benefit is here is less wells, less overall footprint, you get a higher amount of EUR or ultimate gas recovered uh, per well, which is a really important um, thing for us to be focused on as well, of course. And what we see time and time again in plays in the US, proven story in Queensland, in the CSG, in Cooper Basin with the efforts there, the cost coming out over time. When you have focused activity, repetitive activity, you see the learning curves kick in and it's very well established that those costs will come down once you get into that development scale. So our costs will come down and what we're seeing in the US repeated time and time again is an increase in productivity. And both of those things together will of course uh, lower the overall delivery cost. There's an important table in the last slide of the presentation that if you drop by you can run through with Chris or I and we'll um, talk you through that sort of next three or four year plan again be able to show you enough detail and so I'll very much look forward to speaking to you if you've got interest after today's presentation and, and thank you all very much for your time. That was very impressive, very impressive indeed. Thank you so much, David Close. <laughs> Dr. Mark Cooksey, let's see how you go with your timing. The bell, as I said, will be rung at two minutes. That was very, very impressive. 
Uh, right, ABX Group. ABX Group is creating new sources and technologies for strategic um, minerals and chemicals by discovering and developing niche deposits and developing novel chemical engineering processes. Here to present is CEO, Dr. Mark Cooksey. Will you please make him very welcome, everyone? So thank you very much. Uh, so Australia relies on imports for a number of strategic minerals and chemicals. And if they were cut off for any reason, we really would suffer uh, severely economically. So I've got a 25 year background in process development, uh, Rio Tinto and CSIRO. And now I've been with ABX Group the last couple of years. And the one thing I would like you to take away from today's presentation is that ABX Group is judiciously focusing on a small number of opportunities to create new supplies of strategic minerals and chemicals. So the standard disclaimer about some forward-looking statements and, and forecasts. And the overview of ABX Group, uh, you can see over the last 12 months, um, share price uh, increased in the last few months, um, particularly on two of our rare earth announcements. So they've been quite significant achievements. And today I'm gonna to talk about two, our main two uh, areas of interest. So the first one actually I'm gonna discuss is aluminum fluoride, which is a strategic chemical we need for aluminum smelting. And the second one is our exploration for rare earth elements, which as you know, are increasing, incre increasing demand globally. So firstly, aluminum fluoride. So aluminum fluoride, you've probably never heard of it. A lot of people who work in the industry have never heard of it, but it's an absolutely essential chemical for aluminum smelting. It's an additive that must be added to the process to keep a smelter working efficiently. A bit like, if you remember AdBlue for diesel, when we had a problem with AdBlue supply uh, late last year, we were worried we wouldn't be able to produce diesel. Aluminum fluoride is a bit like that. If you don't, if you don't have it to add into your aluminum smelter, you can't run a smelter. If supplies were cut off for any reason, it's within a couple of weeks, you'd be at serious risk of shutting a smelter, which is a $100 million uh, problem. It's a reasonable market, it's over a million tonnes produced a year, so it's worth over a billion dollars. Um, Australia, despite being the about the sixth largest producer of aluminium in the world, is the largest aluminium producing region without producing its own aluminium fluoride. So everywhere else, they basically have an aluminium fluoride plant that supplies their local smelters, whether that's the Middle East or North America or Europe. We're the only ones that don't, We're just never bothered. So we have to import all of it. And of course, that mostly comes from China. It's also a relatively high cost material um, because fluorine is actually quite an expensive element. You, you get fluorine from a mineral called floor spar. Uh, there's not that much of that high grade floor spar around the world. Australia doesn't have much at all. We don't mine any floor spar. It's partly the reason why we don't make any aluminium fluoride. So, Ironically, the aluminium smelting industry has a, a problem with the waste material. Uh, it's, called, it's called excess bath. It's, it's a material used in the smelting process. And a typical smelter tends to produce a surplus of this material over time. And for decades, the only outlet for it was to sell that to new smelters somewhere that were being constructed. So for the last 20 years, simplistically speaking, in the West, Smelters producing some of this waste material, lots of smelters being built in China. Great, you can take all our material and everyone's happy. Now there's not many new smelters being built in China or anywhere. So suddenly over the last few years, the industry is going, we've got this waste material uh, that we can't get rid of. Now this waste material is 50% fluorine. So you go, well, here's an opportunity. Can we take this waste material, which is becoming quite intractable, that's 50% fluorine and turn that into aluminium fluoride for which we have a strategic need. And so that's what Alcor is doing. Alcor is a 83% owned subsidiary of ABX Group. And so we have developed a process, you know, a circular economy process, take the waste material that's full of fluorine from the smelter, process that back into aluminium fluoride and some other co-products and sell the aluminium fluoride back to the smelter. It solves a number of problems at the same time. The aluminium fluoride obviously contains fluorine, but also aluminium. And we 
we are also developing ways to get a cheaper source of aluminium for the aluminium fluoride. And uh, one of them could be bauxite and another could be a, it's called dross. It's another waste from the aluminium smelting process. So the overall aim is to, is to produce aluminium fluoride at lower cost, preferably using waste materials. And when you look at the economics, and I can talk about with you this more later, there's a few scenarios here. These, this, these, this slide's been released to the market, so you can look at your leisure there. But under a variety of scenarios, it all looks very positive. And basically that's because aluminium fluoride, the main cost of it is the raw materials, like 75% of the cost is the raw materials. We're using a cheaper raw material, therefore we make a big hit on the operating cost. Hence there's attractive margins. So what we've been doing, we have, a, we have a laboratory on the central coast of New South Wales where we've demonstrated this process in the lab. We say, yes, we can get fluorine out of the, this smelter bath waste. We can make aluminium fluoride out of it. So that's an example of uh, up, upgraded equipment that we've installed just over the last uh, few months at our labs. And we're then moving to what we call the pilot plant stages. So we can say, look, the process works in in like in theory, in chemistry terms, um, we don't know enough yet to build a commercial plant. We don't know how the engineering works. So we're building the pilot plant, which will process say 20 kilograms an hour of this bath material to ensure that we have a process that can work at commercial scale. So that process is starting now, that design process, we're in the middle of it now. And it's a very, you know, process, I've been doing this for a long time, process scallop is very difficult. You want to do it as fast as you can to minimise costs, but you don't want to make a big mistake and build a big plant that doesn't work. So we're trying to really use all our engineering knowledge and partner with other people with expertise to do this scale up in the quickest, but also most effective manner. And the commercial plan is to put a aluminium fluoride plant in Bell Bay in Northern Tasmania. So that's a existing heavy industry area with an aluminium smelter and other heavy industry. They're keen for more uh, heavy industry there. Uh, we're in discussions about particular uh, site locations. And we will start with a, what we call a, a sort of a smaller commercial plant there on the, it's the, the third box, which is 1300 tons a year of aluminium fluoride. That will be cash flow positive but also really demonstrate the process. And then we'll build as large a plant as we can in Bell Bay, which is likely to be 20,000 tonnes a year. And the constraints there are about um, uh, the supply materials and where do the products go? 20,000 tonnes looks about the right amount. That's approximately the Australian consumption of aluminium fluoride. So simplistically, we would be taking bath from the Australian smelters and some other smelters, turning that into aluminium fluoride, which then means that the Australian smelters are now not reliant on imports of aluminium fluoride. And thereafter, we would then say, oh, let's build other plants in other major aluminium producing regions overseas. I get calls from aluminium smelters overseas saying, we've got this real waste problem with this bath. When are you getting your, how can we help you get your process up and running? Because you need to solve our problem, please. And just to demonstrate the overall schedule, we started uh, back in 2018-19, built our laboratory, um, proved the concept. We're now moving to the pilot plant stage and, and we've got a clear line to commercial. So we've been making steady progress despite a pandemic and us being locked down. We were able to continue our experimental and commercial work during that period. Okay, now for something completely different. Our other major area of effort is rare earth elements. So I presume a lot of people now who have heard about rare earths, they're heavily used in many applications. Um, there's 15 different ones. So there's, there's literally dozens or hundreds of different applications. Demand is growing rapidly. Importantly, China dominates the whole value chain. Not, I mean, partially the mining, but even more importantly, the downstream, the processing, and even now into the manufacture of products using rare earths. And the prices can vary enormously between different rare, rare earths and over time. And this is because when you mine them, you mine a whole set of them. They're all, they're all in there together. And there's obviously a certain proportion of you know, one rare earth more than another. And then you've got the demand, which again has a certain proportion of one and another, and they don't match. So the ones where you're a bit short, 
the prices go through the roof, the ones where you, you got too much of it, they're not worth that much. Um, and also you can't substitute them. So you can't say, oh, in, in this application, we're using rare earth A, uh, it's too expensive, we'll switch to rare earth B. It's not that easy. So the prices can really uh, go quite high. But despite the fact that there's dozens or hundreds of applications, the dominant application by value particularly is permanent magnets. So they range from little magnets in your phones uh, to now bigger ones in um, uh, batteries. And I believe in a, in a wind turbine, the motors have a magnet you know, that, might, that might weigh two tons, you know, giant, these giant wind turbines. And because the demand is growing so rapidly for that, and the rare earths required are quite expensive, 90% of the value of the entire rare earth market is in these permanent magnets. So it's the ones ideally that you wanna be mining and processing. Now, another important thing about rare earth deposits is broadly speaking, there's two types. Most rare earths are produced from what are called um, hard rock deposits, uh, minerals, so the big Linus mine in Western Australia, reasonably good grades, but very expensive processing to separate all, to, to get the rare earths out of the mineral. It turns out that the particular rare earths that are used in the permanent magnets, most of them come from a different type of rare earth deposit, almost totally from China. It's called ionic adsorption clay. And it's where the rare earth is loosely joined to a clay and it's much cheaper and easier to extract it. And also there's a higher proportion of the, the valuable rare earths used for permanent magnets. And the fact that it's lower cost also means that you can get it, uh, it's cheaper and easier to get it up into production, shorter time. <laughs> so, uh, so what's ABX doing? So we have discovered rare earths in Northern Tasmania. We're the first company to discover rare earths in Tasmania. And you can see on the map there, it spans quite a range over 50 kilometers. And it looks like a really attractive opportunity. So firstly, the grades are reasonable, consistent with ionic clays uh, in China. The important thing about these rare earth deposits is you have to check that you can get the rare earths out of them. It's easy to think, oh, we've got lots of rare earths, great but you need to do the actual testing to say, can you extract the rare earth out? And we've done that first stage of testing using ANSTO, the, the, like the nuclear facility in Sydney, who are the, one of the global experts in this. And the results came back very positive. They, said, they actually said to me, no, Mark, this looks pretty good. Uh, you're getting pretty high recoveries at first pass, which is good. And they're not that deep. Um, and also very low levels of uh, radioactive elements. So it's a you know, really attractive opportunity. And so our strategy um, is to try and get up a profitable, pro you know, you can start off small, but a profitable project as soon as possible. And so what we're doing right now is a, a further drilling campaign to extend our understanding and, and how big a deposit we may have. We're doing further metallurgical testing to optimize the recovery, maximize the recovery of the rare earth from the clay. We're developing better exploration techniques so that we can more rapidly find more rare earths and also characterizing the clays to really understand how the rare earths are in there and how we can get them out at lowest cost. So, as I said, we are, ABX Group is about creating new supplies of strategic minerals and chemicals. And I thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any further questions later this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Cooksey. And bad host for today. Can I just remind you all to turn off or turn your mobile phones under silent, reach into your bags now and do so, or I will have to do something awful to the next person. <laughs> Especially you, you've been here so many times, you should be better than that. <laughs> I'm expecting better for the next session. <laughs> all right. Oh, while I've got your attention aside from our presentations too, I know some of you haven't handed in your tickets for the door price. So make sure you do that at lunchtime as well when you go through too. So we're talking vanadium next, second time I've heard vanadium, um, but I went looking for more information about vanadium, named after Vanadis, the Norse god for beauty because of the beautiful colour. Are you having any pretty colourful pictures of vanadium today? 
Good. Uh, not of vanadium, but lots of pretty colored pictures, yes. Excellent. Wait, I can't hear you over there. Who's talking over there? Bradley. <laughs> okay. This is Ian Prentice. He's the managing director. I'm watching you of the tech metal story. Okay. So he's our next presenter. So, um, Ian, you're here because Technology Metals Australia is developing the world's next large scale primary vanadium mine. They're doing that up in the Murchison region in Western Australia. And the company also has some very um, down, some big downstream ambitions. You know, I'm going to let you tell more about it because otherwise I'll eat into 15 minutes. Would you please make him very welcome, everyone? Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Christy. I could hand over to you and let you do it if you like. But um, um, yeah, so as, as well as Vanadis, the interesting thing about vanadium, um, King Arthur's sword had vanadium steel in it because it was a very big beast. So it needed vanadium to, to um, lighten the, the steel. So, And it was also the Model T Ford um, had it in its chassis. So mm -hmm. a, very, sort of a little bit of a history snapshot. Um, this presentation's up on the, uh, on the ASX platform and on our website. Um, the one I'm running through is going to be a bit of a cut down version, so all the detail will be on the on the platform, or you can come and talk to us at our uh, at our booth. Mm -hmm. um, so, why invest in technology metals? Well, as Chrissy just said, we, we're going to be the next um, large scale primary vanadium producer in the world. Um, we've got a very long life, large scale, um, high purity um, product that's going to come out of our, our project, um, and we're targeting a development decision by the end of this year. So six months away, we'll be talking about a development decision and, and with the ambition of progressing into construction next year. Um, we are part of the Future Energy, energy Solution. So vanadium, if you're not aware, is used in large scale um, stationary, stationary storage batteries, so um, long duration storage. So. Our new energy minister, Mr. Bowen, keeps on talking about uh, needing um, this uh, storage to make renewables more efficient. Um, this is one of the very best solutions for all that. So it's a really exciting time for where we're going with all that. And, and as Chrissy said, we are also moving into downstream. So we're actually going to take our product and move it into the vanadium electrolyte that you need to make these batteries work. Um, we are a globally significant project. We're going to have around about 7% of the world's supply going into a, a critical mineral space. Um, and very, very strategically important product. And, and of, of course, very, very importantly, to get a project like this up and running, we need a really good quality management team and board, which uh, we're, we're blessed with that. A bit unresponsive from the clicker, there we go. Corporate structure, we're, we're in a very strong position. We raised $20 million last year. We got um, resource capital funds, a, a large um, mining private equity group came on board after doing extensive due diligence. And uh, they were a, a, a big contributor to that $20 million capital raise. As it shows there, we've still had $19 million left at the end of the March quarter, and we're still in a very strong position now. We had some options exercised during the last quarter. So really strong financial position. Um, listed end of 2016, but we're still a pretty tight capital structure with 210 million shares on issue. And you can see the, the, the strength of our, uh, of our register, um, 50 odd percent held in the top 20. So it's a, a nice, uh, nice capital structure to be moving into this development phase. Um, I won't dwell too much on this as so you can come and have a chat to us at the booth, but a couple of the key um, recent appointments, if you like. So Jackie Murray is the RCF nominee, um, came on board last uh, late last year. Fantastic value add to the team. Um, a really good, strong ESG focus, which companies obviously as we progress into this uh, development phase, very, very important for us. And then Dave English, our Chief Operating Officer. Um, he's built mines in Western Australia. He, he built De Grusser. He built Nova for Independence Group. He also spent a couple of years at the Windamara Vanadium Project, which is really, really important, uh, um, I guess, attribute for someone coming into a new project. Um, ESG, very, very important to all of us. Um, things we do just as our normal course of business, but it's, it's more about how we're now um, communicating that to the market and to investors and, uh, and, and the finances for a project like ours. So what we're doing, um, good, good environmental husbandry, good uh, um, relationships in the community. We're gonna be a very long life operation. So we expect to come out with some news shortly, which we'll talk about a 25 year mine life. So we're gonna be there for decades. So being a strong part of our local community is very, very important for us. And, and obviously governance and, and looking after our people is critically important as well. Um, so just a bit about vanadium, uh, for those that aren't, aren't aware, um, majority goes into steel. And, and we've demonstrated in, in recent times that by increasing the amount of vanadium you put into steel, 
you, you, you can use less steel for certain applications, um, mainly into construction steel, rebar, um, but that flows through to by, by producing less steel for those applications, you're actually having less emissions. So a really solid um, carbon um, emission reduction by using vanadium in steel, but really exciting for us is the applications in batteries. So that, that photo there is of a battery that Sumitomo has installed in Japan. Um, that's, we call it a battery. It's really a power station. These are massive um, units. They've got a liquid electrolyte that pumps through them um, and, and you know, can store very, very large amounts of, of energy and store for a very long time. Um, they don't degrade over time. They'll last for 20 years, um, multiple, multiple cycles, over 20,000 cycles during their life. Um, so they've got some massive advantages over, over some of the other um, applications or, or, or peers in the space. So um, one of the other really neat things of these is the vanadium in these batteries is 100% recyclable. So at the end of the 20 odd year life of the battery, the physical life of the battery, the vanadium can be pumped out and reused. So very, very important. And again, part of that green credential of, of this metal. Um, it's a really interesting market we're in at the moment. Um, you know, forecasts out, you know, indicating consumption growth um, really underpinned by steel with a bit of battery life coming into there as well um, and not enough uh, production to really meet that target. So, so um, we're talking about an extra 25,000 tonnes of vanadium units required by 2025. Um, we're going to be producing around 7,000 tonnes when we're up and running. And as I say, we'll be one of the largest primary vanadium producers in the world. So a really good opportunity in that marketplace. And a couple of, uh, I guess, takeaways around the, around the commodity, um, China and Russia, they're the biggest suppliers, biggest producers in the market. And obviously at the moment, uh, they're not necessary flavor of the, of the decade really. So um, what the rest of the world is gonna be looking for is alternative supplies. So that other bullet point there, so talking about Europe and North America, outside of China, they're the biggest consumers and they basically have pretty well zero production of vanadium. So a fantastic opportunity for us coming into development in this environment where we're going, you know, moving away from thermal energy, moving into more and more renewables and you need the storage, but also where you've got this geopolitical climate where we're going to be really, um, I guess, well supported by uh, some of our traditional allies. Um, storage and re renewable space. This is some data that just come out recently around the projections for the, the uh, vanadium redox flow battery storage and out to 2030. Um, the indicating 30 gigawatts of storage will be required by 2030. I, I read an article just in the last couple of days saying that Europe alone will need 55 gigawatts of stationary storage by 2030. So, so this is a forecasting that across the globe, vanadium redox flow batteries will take up 30 gigawatts. That needs 170,000 tonnes of vanadium to achieve that. And again, we're going to produce 7,000. So this, is, this market is, is, is in for a bit of a shake up and going to need a lot of new supply. Um, the US Department of Energy, along with Chris Bowen, um, talking about the needs for uh, long duration storage. So you can't have renewables operating efficiently without having some really good storage solutions in there. And VRFBs, um, it's been a bit of a slow burn on these, but they're really taking off now. So I, I did a presentation in April over in Perth at a battery conference, talked then about having 115 batteries installed. Since then, we're now at 179. So these batteries are really getting a lot of momentum and you know, that chart shows where we're gonna be going to. The project itself, the really important thing, you know, we're, we're situated in the middle of Western Australia, great um, jurisdiction for developing projects. Um, mining leases are granted. We're at the final step of delivering our EPA approval. Um, so we've done a huge amount of work, technical work on the project. We completed a definitive feasibility study in 2019. We're now at that st stage where once you've got your environmental approvals, you actually have a project. So we're, we're very, very excited about that step. Um, one of the highest grade resources in the world and certainly uh, in Australia, um, we're going to be on the, the lowest cost quartile. Um, again, very, very important when you're talking about a long life asset. Um, and we're using conventional processing. Um, as much as we all love innovation and, and, and very, very pleased to see some innovation having from our previous speaker, but we're not taking that risk on. We've got conventional processing, which is tried and true. We know it's gonna work. And we've done a heap of test work to, to really um, underline that. We've done pilot test work in the US on very large samples, um, really sets us aside from our peers in that we've sent seven tons of material off to do pilot, continuous pilot test work of that, of that processing route. Um, premium product, which is really important when we go into the battery space. So we get that straight out of the mine gate. And importantly, and, and I'll try and touch on this if I've got time, um, we, we have a titanium product. We didn't have the titanium product when, it, when it, we did our feasibility study. We've got a satellite um, deposit, which is called Yarrabubba. 
down at Yarrabubba, we not only get a really high grade vanadium feed, we also get a nilmonite um, byproduct. So we can, we can produce titanium out of our tail stream, which is going to be an additional revenue um, line for us. And uh, it's really, as it says there, it's a real game changer for development of our project. With 18, 19 million dollars cash at the bank, we are fully funded all the way through to financial close on this project. A bit more of a deep dive on the projects themselves. You see the large yellow area at the top, that's Gavin Intha, that's where the bulk of the resources are. That's what, that was the, the area we did the feasibility study on back in 2019. And then down the road, we've got uh, Yarrabubba, the smaller footprint, quite, still quite a large resource, 38 million tonnes. As I say, that's the real game changer in that we've got high grade vanadium, higher grade vanadium going into the, into the um, processing plant from Yarrabubba, but we have that titanium product. And that's really, really critical for our, our next few steps. We've been doing um, what we call an integration study, which is putting those two projects together and then coming up with an updated reserve and updating production sh schedule. That'll be out in the next little while, next few weeks. But we're also launched into what we're calling the implementation phase, which is going to ultimately deliver a, a bankable financial model. Um, but it's really about stepping through to take this from a study phase into actual development. And so We'll, we'll have all the, all the normal technical stuff that we'll be delivering on. But what we're doing is we're actually going directly to suppliers and vendors and, and going out for competitive uh, commercial tenders um, and going to groups to say, get on board. You're, you're going to be supplying this bit of equipment. Here's a contract. We're going to be building this next year. Um, timetable and news. I think, Christy, I'm going to um, end up with a few minutes up my sleeve. Um, a lot, lot happening. Um, integration study, as I mentioned, most of that's done. We're going to come up with this updated reserve and, and production schedule in in, you know, in the next few weeks into July. Um, and but importantly, it's about this implementation phase and the work streams we're doing that, which are going to be all about delivering the project. Two two highlighted items there. There's a lot happening. There's a lot of news flows going to happen, but those two highlighted ones are the real keys getting that EPA approval that says you actually do have a project. You've got all your permitting and approvals as well as all the fantastic technical work and a fantastic technical project, but that, that very, very important EPA approval. And then that leads to a development decision. So development decision is when I ask my board to allocate some capital to place orders for long lead items. So the kiln that we need, they're talking about 70 weeks for that to be delivered. So we want to put that order in as soon as we possibly can to get that clock started. So then we can make sure we get delivery on our on our um, ambitions on when we want to be in production. So, and then, then into next year, it's financial close, it starts starting construction and uh, we start to move through to, uh, to being that next uh, um, primary vanadium producer in the world. So just to round that all off, um, whoop, one too far. We are a globally significant project in a critical mineral. Um, we've got a fantastic team in place. Dave English is building a really strong team to, to drive the, the development of this project through to, to delivery. As I say, he's done it before and uh, he's got a really great uh, reputation and track record and, and, and uh, will we'll, uh, no doubt be doing it again with us. Um, Great having RCF come on board last year as a strategic investor and a cornerstone to really support their ambitions around the development. Um, we do have a very strong focus on delivery in the full slide deck. We, we've put in a, uh, a bit of a pat, pat on the back chart that shows all the things we've done since we listed in 2016 and, and it's pretty busy. Um, and we're operating in a great environment, stable West Australia, fantastic place to be operating on. And as I said earlier, um, opportunity then to engage North America, Europe, Japan, um, with some product that they're currently having to get out of uh, Russia or China. So on that note, I'll, um, I'll wrap up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian Prentice. Very informative indeed. Right. Spider-Man, Iron Man, Hulk, Captain America, Chris Van Wick. They all have something in common. Marvel Gold. Now, the first four of them use Marvel Gold as currency in a billion dollar online gaming platform. This one, the last one, Chris Van Wick, is firmly focused on delivering gold in Mali, particularly in southern Mali. And these are discoveries that could transform our investment portfolios into superhero status. And we would like that, wouldn't we? Yes, okay. Now, the company's current focus, as I said, is that exploration of its projects in southern Mali. Chris is going to tell us more. Let's welcome the man himself, Marvel Gold MD, Mr. Chris Van Wick. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was quite the introduction. I hope, I, I hope my presentation can live up to the hype. <laughs> 
Anyway, we'll get started. I'm, I'm proud to present to you on behalf of Marvel Gold. My name is Chris Van Veek. I'm, I'm the managing director. I'm a geologist by background, so please excuse me if I uh, take a, an excursion on the exploration slides and gloss over the corporate stuff. But if, you, if you'd like any more detail, feel free to pop by the booth and I'll, I'll be happy to explain anything that I might have missed. Standard disclaimer. The, in a nutshell, Marvel Gold is a, is a pretty simple story. We, we have a, a million ounces of gold in Mali. Um, we've managed to cobble together 831 square kilometers around that resource that gives us a really fantastic platform for exploration moving forward. The deposit has excellent metallurgy. We, we did a, a program at the start of last year and we got recoveries up to 97% in the finest grind sizes. The deposit's pretty favorable in terms of mining. It's a, it's a shear hosted deposit, so it's 3.2 kilometers long. In the northwest part, it, uh, it's up to three loads, and so it gives us a pretty favorable strip ratio of about four to one over the life of mine. We've, we've had a really busy year. We've done 30 kilometers, uh, 30,000 meters of auger drilling this year and 17,000 meters of echo drilling. So it's, it's, this year's really been about trying to make the discoveries that are going to, you know, Take, take the company to the next level. And I've got a few slides in here that I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about. And one of the things that really sort of sets us apart from most of the other juniors here is that we have 31% of another listed company called Evolution Energy Minerals, which is a graphite company uh, that we recently floated out. And that was the precursor of, of Marvel. The corporate structure, we've got 700 million shares on issue. Today, we're sitting around three cents, so it gives us a market cap of 21 million. We did a rights issue that was, that was taken up in full a couple of months ago, so we've got $4 million in the bank. And as I said, a, a listed investment that's worth about $15 million at today's value. So it gives us an extremely low enterprise value, and I'll, I'll touch on that in the next slide. The register is quite institutional. Uh, Capital DI is the investment wing of Capital Drilling. They have a fund that's worth 30, 30 odd million dollars at today, and, and they're one of our major shareholders. And the Delphi Group is a German fund that invests in a lot of junior explorers as well. Uh, so they're, they're sort of level pegging. Uh, BPM Capital is the chairman of Capital Drilling, Jamie Boyton, and, and Joseph Alragi, who's ex Sentiment. Um, we've got a couple of other funds in there Ixios Asset Management below that, and Board and Management holding about 2.5%. I'm the managing director, Phil Hoskins, the XMD is, is on our board as a non-executive director. Phil's a, a corporate guy and reasonably well-known. He's now managing the, the graphite company, EV1. Stephen Dennis, again, a, a well-known chairman, very strong on the corporate governance side. And Andrew Party is a geologist, ex-CEO of Sentiment, and uh, now the managing director of Predictive Discovery. So also very familiar with the West African landscape. As I touched on before, we're, we're trading really at a, a, a ridiculous discount to our peers. You know, once you net out the listed investments and the cash, we're at about one and a half dollars per resource ounce. So we're really not getting see-through value on, on our gold assets. Um, and that's something that we, we're looking to address moving forward. We've got three projects in Mali. Uh, the flagship project is Tavakaroli, shown in the center of the slide. Colin Dieba to the east is really exciting. We've got the first results back for that. I'll touch on those a little bit later. And Jan Falila out to the west is in a, a really tight, tightly held belt. Um, several shears running through it. It's, it's a very prospective project as well. We're, we're in an area of really good infrastructure. So Bamako, the capital city, is sort of shown on the top of the map. We've got a, a tarred road down to Baguni and then 60 kilometers of dirt road down to the flagship project, Tabakaroli. So if you leave at breakfast time in the morning, you're, you're there for morning tea at Tabakaroli. It's, it's pretty easy to get to. I've had a few people come up and ask me about Mali. And obviously, you know, you only see the bad stuff in the press. And I guess the northeastern part of Mali is, is terrible. You can't go there. This part of Mali, we don't need security. I've, I've come back from there three weeks ago. We did about a thousand kilometers over the course of a week, driving around, visiting each of these projects and no issues at all. So we're in the good part of Mali. This is one for the geologists. So traditionally, there have been three belts sort of described in Mali, the Siama belt in the east, the Marilla belt centrally, and, and the Anfalila belt. And the bit in the middle was sort of known as the Baguni granite terrain. Um, we've, as I said, we've put together 831 kilometers, square kilometers of ground there as a project. And we've now drilled, you know, a combination of 
47,000 meters of drilling this year, and we haven't hit any granite. So the map is clearly wrong. We, uh, we're in the Bermian sediments, and, and we think it's a, a fantastic place to explore. And the significance of this map, really, we've drawn a 50 kilometer radius around our project. We, we have no other listed companies uh, within that 50 kilometer radius. And, and so, you know, we believe this to be a great opportunity for us. There's no one else kind of pegging on our doorstep. But at the same time, there's not another mill. So this, this needs to be a standalone opportunity, which is what we've been trying to, trying to get up and going. In, I suppose, separately from the rest of Mali, this is an area where the magnetics does work. So mo for most of Mali, the magnetics is pretty bland. We, we spent most of last year doing ground magnetics, so walking 50, kilometer, uh, 50 meter spaced lines of ground mag, and that's, that's given us a fantastic data set to look at the structure of, of this area. And we've improved upon that uh, with some IP that we've just recently done on the Tabacaroli corridor, which is, is going to improve our understanding even, even more. So within that, we did soil sampling across the whole lot, and we've developed a number of targets, and, and I'll talk to you about several of those in, in the next few slides. As I said before, Tabacaroli is a fantastic deposit. It's 3.2 kilometers long. It's got some really good hits. So in, in sort of the central area down here, we've got 60 meters at 2.9. Um, most recently at the tail end of last year, we, we discovered a new load parallel, but to the north of the, the main load and best hits up there, 17 at 3.6 um, and 16 at two. So that's pretty exciting. We've, we've got some work there to follow that up and, and close it off. And you can sort of see a long strike. There are a number of holes there. We, we knew that there was mineralization there, but those holes had mostly tagged it from drilling from south to north. And so the mineralization was pretty deep. We, we've now shown that that mineralization, whoops. We've now shown that that mineralization actually daylights. And so this is an area of focus for us going forward. Um, one of the other areas around the deposit on the inner bend here, there are a number of holes that you can see that are outside of the resource outline. There's an area there that's about 450 meters long that's, that's got some good grade in it as well. So we're slowly working towards tidying up the resource and, and adding to that. But as I mentioned this year, really the focus has been on, on trying to make additional discoveries on the rest of our land holding. And we've made good progress on that too. This is the Northwest area that I was just talking about where we, we discovered this section up here. It's, um, it's running really good grades, so over two grams a ton, it, it sort of will help drive the, the resource grade up. Um, the <laughs> Sorry, broke my stride there. Um, this is the area I mentioned in between. There, there's been very little drilling here, but given what we did last year, we're, we're pretty confident that if we drill in this area here, we're going to add to some of that mineralization going forward. This is a slide all about the resource. So we've got a million ounces at 1.2 grams. That's using a 0.6 gram cutoff, which is, which is pretty, it's much higher than our peers. You know, most of these resources in West Africa, you'll see using about a 0.4 gram cutoff. So you're, you're kind of free to choose your own adventure within that. Um, but a million ounces at, at 1.2 is where we, we hang our hat. I mentioned the metallurgical program. We, we did a, the, the ore deposit has arsenopyrite in it. So coming into this, we, we realized that there was a risk of um, refractory ore here. So pretty early on in the piece, we did a program of metallurgical drilling. We took four diamond drill holes from across the deposit. We targeted comps that were, that were round about the resource grade. So, you know, there's, there's no funny business here. You'll see a lot of these slides where people take, you know, comps that are much higher than their resource grade and then tell you that the recovery is fantastic. We've got a, a representative sample along the strike length and at the same grade as the resource, and we get fantastic recoveries across a range of grind sizes. I mentioned the, the geochemistry. So my, my background as a geologist, I love doing geochemistry. We've taken a, a huge number of soil samples and we had them analyzed for multi-elements. And what, what we're trying to do here is not just identify the gold, but you know, we know that there are pathfinder elements in here. So arsenic being one of them, Tellurium, tungsten, silver, and, and bismuth are, are typically the, the elements that we look at. And where you've got more than one of these elements that line up, you know you're onto a reasonably strong target. So the, the geochemistry definitely highlights the Tabacaroli trend as, as being one of the most fertile sort of trends. Um, there are several other areas up here. There's a tin tungsten anomaly with some gold that we drilled. Um, down here, there's a big granite intrusive and, and a number of anomalous gold zones along it. 
So we put a bit of work into all of these and we're still waiting on the multi-element work. That, that all goes away to Canada. It, it's taken a very long time. So we've got the gold results. We don't yet have the multi-elements, but what we're waiting to see there in the auger drilling is you know, areas where we've got gold. If we've got any of the other pathfinders, those targets will probably need some more work going forward. One of the most exciting targets that we drilled this season was called Lone Wolf. And we called it Lone Wolf because there was a single RC hole drilled by historical workers that hit 12 meters at 1.2 and was never followed up. We, we had no context as to why they drilled that hole, where they drilled it, and also why they didn't follow it up. So we put a couple of air core lines uh, across this target. These are, I think, 200 meter spacing. And the best of these, these air core lines hit four meters at 1.3 and ended at four meters at 2.7 in mineralization. So we planned a very limited RC program, 400 meters of RC, so five 80 meter holes. And the, the best of those holes was at the southeastern end. We hit nine meters at 1.8, 14 meters at 4.9 and 10 at 1.9. So definitely an all grade intercept. And as you can see, the, the image in the background is magnetics. We've got a pretty discrete magnetic low, and we're reasonably confident that this mineralization is associated with the contact of, of that mag low. So we're, we're pretty excited to kind of follow this target up in, in the next season. A long strike from that, we, we drilled a number of other targets as well. So I left the air core drilling at Lone Wolf on here to illustrate the point that down here, we've got 600 meters of anomalous strike at this target called Target H. And our best hit in there was a single air core hole that was seven meters at 2.1 grams per ton. So this target, Target H, is certainly shaping up to be you know, similar to, to what we've got, what we think we've got up at Lone Wolf. And then Target I and J, same thing, anomalous gold. These are the grades down here of, of the end of hole auger drilling. There's a chance that these targets line up. I mean, you can see some very large structures in the magnetics coming through here. And uh, so the hope, is, the hope is that we've got a couple of other things uh, that are carrying mineralization along strike down, you know, within a couple of kilometers of, of the deposit. We, we've done a lot of geophysics. As I said, we did 50 meter line space ground mag. And, and what we've been working on for the last couple of months is a big IP survey. So this is the outline of the IP survey. IP is very good at picking up disseminated sulfides. And we know that all of this gold is associated with sulfides. And so the hope is that this IP is going to give us not only a, a, another data set to, to guide our structural targeting, but also highlight zones that are full of sulfides, and we can go and directly target those. Colin Dieber, this, this news is hot off the press. The results literally came in the night before last. We got the news out yesterday, and, and this slide went in yesterday afternoon. So this is one that I'm, I'm extremely excited about. I, I think we could be on the verge of, of a new discovery here. So it's... Uh, the reason I say that, this target out here, target four, is a long strike from known mineralization at a prospect called Kalaka, which is held by a London-listed company. And we've got 1.7 grams and 1.5 grams in the auger. And on the main trend, the, the main shear zone runs along here. On the main trend, you know, we've had 10 holes return over a gram of gold per ton in auger. Now, we'd normally get pretty excited about anything over about 100 parts per billion. So, you know, things over a gram, this is screaming. It's, uh, it's really exciting, but we're not going to get to test that for a few months yet. Jan Falila, we've had Orga ongoing. Uh, we yet to finish that program. Results will be out in the next month or two. We, we like to be a part of our community, and so we've put in a number of water bores. These are solar water bores and uh, pumped up to a header tank. It, it saves the community a lot of time in drawing water. Uh, and this is the last slide. So the reason to buy Marvel Gold um, we're going to make more discoveries. We're going to keep drilling and uh, we're ridiculously cheap compared to our peers. If you'd like more info, please come via the booth. Thank you. Well, marvel, Mr. Van Ricker, marvel. Thank you so much. Right. Our next presenter is a Melbourne local who followed a fellow to Kalgoorlie, was well and truly bitten by the gold bug. She gave up teaching and she became a fully fledged prospector, a very successful one, I might add. And in 2020, she established Tambora Metals to get funding to develop projects. And it was perfect timing, Rita, wasn't it? Absolutely perfect timing because you pegged around, it was at Julema, where yes. Chalice yes. has that $3 billion project. Mm -hmm. So they went, was it March 2020, they were 10 cents. So that was an extraordinary story. So. Mm -hmm. The question for all of us, I suppose, is where could Rita take Tambora 
and us as potential shareholders uh, in two years. Please welcome her to the microphone, everyone. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to present the Tambora story. Tambora listed in hmm, this one. Tambora listed in August uh, 2021. We raised $8 million. We've still got 4.9 million. And we're established with gold, lithium, and nickel PGAs. We've got six projects now in the portfolio. And our main area is the Pilbara and just out of Perth in the Julemar region. So I'll just go back. So which one? This one? No, I'll just go forward. Big green. <laughs> Thank you. So we're well funded and our main projects when we're working in the Pilbara, gold and lithium sit side by side at Pilgangora where they've got a tier one lithium mine and it's right next to gold project of Kairos. We're very similar in that Tambora gold field. We take our historic name from the Tambora gold field and we've both got lithium and nickel and uh, gold What's happening here? Okay, so the corporate overview, we have 14 cent share price at the moment, uh, and we've got 4.9 in the bank. I'm the exec chair, I vended in the projects, so I have a vested interest in developing these. We've got a good strong board, and uh, Kelvin Fox, the exploration manager, on site at Tambora today as we speak with uh, the geologist and field crew. So we're collecting the rest of the samples from our gold drilling program, which we did in March. And we've just announced last week the first three holes, which I'll go into later. We've got strong governance, environmental, social responsibility. We're working with the native uh, groups, the native traditional owners, and our native title agreements are in place. So, and Pilbara Gold, over 10 million ounces has been discovered in the last 10 years in the Pilbara. You know it for iron ore mining, but the gold has really escalated in the last 10 years. We've got three gold projects, the Tambora, the Chila and the Nullagine project. Our maiden drilling program has only just got the results coming through. First three drill holes and 17 more holes to come. In the Pilbara, We've also got three lithium projects for lithium bearing pegmatites at Tambora, Russian Jack and the Nullagine. The nickel targets is a main project and it's we're the largest landholder behind Chalice at um, Julemar North. So that's a quick summary of where we are in the Pilbara. You'll notice the green dots are the lithium mines. You've got Global, Pilbara Minerals and Wajina. And the gold at Hemi in particular has been a wonderful, successful story for gold development. You've got at the Chila, you'll see down in the south of Chila, there's 5 million ounces along that Nanjil Gandhi fault. We've got 75 kilometres to develop and explore. On the right hand side, you'll see Nullagine, and that's held by Nova Resources with an operating mill. And TMB Nullagine has gold and lithium. And to the south, we've got the Russian Jack project, which is Russian Jack named after a, a person from Marble Bar, and he's got his own creek named after him. So gold was discovered in the 1890s, high grade prospector got looking for quart, gold in quartz veins, an ounce a tonne from the 1890s. By the 1910s, there was only two or three prospectors working in the area, but you'll see those traditionally high grade independent gold mines there. We consolidated this gold mine and as a result, Previously, nine hectare leases are now all joined so that we've not got those impediments. So we've got over three to five kilometres of gold uh, in quartz veins that we've been investigating. So that gives you a visual of uh, an aerial shot. If you've got Kushmati, the results from Tambora King, Western Chief South, the Federal and the Western Chief. Two and a half kilometres is from the Kushmati up to the Western Chief. 
So we've got mining lease applications, we're commencing an IP survey to show extensions, and we're ongoing heritage clearances. This gives you a 3D interpretation. On the top, you have the Tambora King, and on the federal, we got a grant uh, of $40,000 to contribute to the drilling of the federal because there's been no drilling there since 1930. And you can see the red is the high grade gold from previous, we assembled all that data. And in between what's unknown, we'll be using IP survey. The recent drill results were from the first three holes at Tambora King. No drilling has taken place here since the 1980s. And of particular interest is the second hole, 22 metres at 2.8 grams, of which nine metres is six grams and one metre at nine. However, that's not the whole story because at 115 metres, we've still got two grams and the prospectors would never have gone down that far. So we're looking forward to presenting the next 17 drill holes shortly. So the Chila is located between the Paulson's 900,000 ounces and the 1.6 million ounces of uh, Mount Olympus. We've got 70 kilometres there. The Nanjulgadi Fault hosts also the Capricorn Minerals Kala Windergold, which is 2.1 million ounces on the southern end of the Nanjulgadi Fault, and that's 300 kilometres southeast of Chila. So we do have historic gold uh, results from when they were looking for base metals as well. And that includes eight metres at eight grams, a shallow gold, 88 metres, 36 metres, et cetera. We're continuing with our heritage agreements and we'll be on the ground sampling. Actually, they're going next week to actually locate some of these previous drill holes because we've got a plan to drill in between. Now, go back in, just back over to the Pilbara on the right hand side, you'll see the Nullagine and the Tambora Russian Jack. So the Russian Jack project is located to the south and you've got the Nullagine historic gold workings. We pegged this ground because they had to have the pegs in the ground. It wasn't available to apply as a large exploration area. However, it contains historic mines. It's right next door to the Novo Beatons Creek processing plant. And we're very excited about this project and we'll be getting on the ground at the end of the year after the grant process and the heritage clearances are completed. But the Garibaldi mine was last mined in 1946, 22 grams a tonne. The Titanic South Prospect, you can see that on the far right. That has three drill holes or six drill holes of one particular drill hole. Historically, it's one metre at 22 grams, one metre at 15, one metre at nine. So this area was neglected, I suppose, because a lot of the old gold mines were, uh, were uh, they were working it to the north. And so this area became of less interest. Over at... Um, I missed something. Julemar North, exciting project, large land holding. You've got uh, the purple is the uh, our ground. We've added to it since we listed. We've got the Wongan Hill South. On the to the west of Wongan Hill South is the Caravel mine, which is a copper, molybdenum, and gold mine. A 25-year mine life. So this seems to get overlooked when we're looking at the Chalice Julemar area, but it's certainly significant and we're looking forward to following up our targets. We, in particular, the, um, we've got, we used a lot of the data, we've got multiple airborne magnetic targets, but we'll be going in to do EM in July. This shows you the target areas that we've been using the geophysical data to interpret and we're going through the processing. This is Bolgart. We did a gravity survey in December. The results were announced in January, and these targets are gonna be used to pinpoint our drilling in after we process in July. Uh, that's Bolgart and Tolano. Tolano is 30 kilometers from Chalice, and it's a similar stratigraphy potentially prospective for nickel, copper, and PGEs. So at Achilles, it's north of Laverton, and uh, to the 
north, 300 kilometres or 130 kilometres northwest is the Rumble Resources Zinc project. We've gone through our data. Historically, there was a 3.8% zinc sample from a gold and nickel program that was uh, completed 20 years ago. So we're looking forward to getting back onto this ground in the quarter three, four. I think the battery's going. What's next? So Julemar North, Bolgart, Tolano and WH South, nickel, copper and PGEs. And we'll be also looking for gold and doing that and continuing that in our sampling. The EM will define the targets so we can get straight onto the ground. We're only two hours out of Perth. Excellent for infrastructure and uh, uh, even the drillers don't mind working out there. Achilles, northeast of Laverton. We've got permits for drilling approved and we'll be on the ground there continuing that work. Pilbara lithium, very exciting growth opportunity defining the sampling, getting some sampling soon. Uh, we've been out and done first pass tests for the pegmatites, and I'll be announcing them in the next couple of weeks. Pilbara Gold, finishing up the 17 drill holes still to be announced, and obviously the labs are very busy. We'll continue planning our IP survey. We're completing further heritage works with our mining leases and the data compilation will continue at Nullagine for historic work. So we are a good investment. We're at 14 cents at the moment. And uh, Chila is a, a large gold project within the Nanjil Gandhi Fault. The Nullagine hosts in excess of 200,000 ounces and we'll be looking for more ounces there. And stay informed, join up, get on the news newsletter, sign up and visit the booth if you have any other questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, I was going to say, did you want to take any questions at all, Rachel, or do you want to chat with them out at the booth? Yeah, at, the booth. at the booth, all right, she wants you at the booth. So lunchtime, you've got a hot day to everyone go and find out more about that perspective. Interesting if she can do the same thing that Chalice did, wouldn't it? That'd be fabulous. Right, can you welcome to the stage, please, Mr. Pascal Blampain, Executive Director of the highly active gold exploration company, Matza Resources. Now, what can I tell you to whet your appetite with about Matza as he makes his way up here? Um, they sold a third of their tenements uh, for $20 million, didn't you? That's actually more than your market cap because that's around 17 million, isn't it? And you're actually Correct. expecting $17 million as well, I think, to be deposited into your coffers in the not too distant future. And you've just done some drilling. So I'm trying to gauge by your face if you've got results or not. If you're happy about them, if you can share them with us, mm -hmm. do you want to share that with everyone? Sure, Would you put I'll your hands about... together, everyone, for Pascal, everyone? Thanks. So we are happy with the drill results visually at this stage. Uh, I'll go through that a little bit later. We have no assays at this right at the moment. So Matz is a primarily gold-focused company based out of Perth. Our uh, our flagship project is at Lake Kerry, centred uh, just about 250 kilometres north or two and a half hours north of um, Kalgoorlie in the eastern gold fields. Of 553,000 ounces at 1.9, reasonably healthy, uh, open pitable, pitable material in resource. And uh, our, our, our exploration play is to build that into a, a 1 million ounce resource in the near future. Uh, usual disclaimers, uh, just a snapshot of the uh, the, the corporate overview. Uh, sadly, our, our share price is, is not quite 4.6 today, it's 4.5. So our market cap is down at $16 million. And as Chrissy just mentioned before, we're expecting $17 million from uh, a sale agreement that we have in place with a private company called Linden Gold. 350 million shares on issue, 358 million. And um, our top 20 shareholders, as you can see there, around about 50 odd percent and uh, very strong support from our Singaporean and uh, German shareholders. So since I've been since last year, I was here uh, a couple of changes in, in, um, in, in Matsa, and I'll discuss some of those developments during the course of the next few slides. The first one being the uh, the sale of Red October and Devon to the private company Linden, as I mentioned before. It's a $20 million transaction. We've had three instalments of non-refundable $1 million uh, per instalment. So at the moment we've received $3 million of that transaction. 
Uh, we still re retained 553,000 ounces in the resource. Red October and Devon represented 314,000 ounces and they sold at an equivalent of um, $64 per ounce, which is quite healthy compared to our enterprise value at the time. The deal gives us an upper cash position of $15.5 million in cash or around about $11 million, depending on um, Lyndon's election in terms of the cash and share ratios. With the indications from Lyndon is that once they list, I'd rather us be uh, in a lower, lower part of the, uh, the share issue, which means that we'll actually have more cash into the bank. Now out of that $20 million, there is a $5 million deferred payment, which is based on the um, Devon project, two and a half million dollars within two and a half, within 24 months from the, the um, from probably around about 30th of June this month, this year, and two and a half million dollars in, in profit sharing from the, uh, the operation itself. Care and maintenance at Red October, that will be taken care of and he's been taken care of by the uh, by Lyndon Gold. The settlement target was uh, June 30. I know at this stage, Lyndon hasn't listed as expected and uh, therefore I expect a bit of slippage on that time frame. The, the rest of the transaction in terms of the detail, I don't expect any slippage on that. The map that you can see there, the red outline represents the uh, the the tenements that are part of the, that are subject to this sale. So you can see there, so around about a, a little bit less than third of our tenement position. So we've still got a really relatively uh, healthy position on the ground there, just uh, just short of uh, 400 square kilometres of ground. The other part about about Matsa is our, our re-entry, I suppose, in some respects into Thailand. We have some very healthy copper projects in the Loy Fold Belt there that you can see up to the top right hand side, just next to Kingsgate Chattery gold mine. So Kingsgate uh, have flagged that they're back into operation. They expect to be pouring gold by the end of this year. That coupled with uh, Pan Asia drilling Rung Kiet project down in the far south of Thailand for lithium and our own um, our, our, our own ongoing communication with government departments indicate that the, uh, the, the tide or the climate for support for exploration and mining in Thailand has, has turned in a positive way. Uh, and therefore we're quite confident that, that uh, going back into Thailand is, is the right step for us. Our copper projects, we actually had those before we had the, the Lake Kerry project that so just indicates how long we actually have been in Thailand, but we did put the projects into hibernation during the last five years or so, whilst the government uh, sorted out its, uh, its mining regulations and support for exploration and mining. What does a sale do for Matsa? And at the, as I mentioned just before, before we sold, before we agreed and signed up the agreement to sell Red October and Devon, we had 867,000 ounces in, uh, in resource. And essentially that translates to around about $27 per resource ounce if um, enterprise value. We sold the 314,000 ounces at $64 an ounce. So we got a, we, we received a bit of a premium on our existing enterprise value. Now the next line there, post sale, the enterprise value, that's a little bit fluid because of the movement in the share price. Right now, our enterprise value based on a, on a settlement of that, that uh, transaction is even less than $14 an ounce. In fact, we're sub 10. So we make for a very compelling case at four and a half cents, that's very cheap entry into the gold market. So the pro forma, what does that look like in terms of uh, like Kerry project, as you can see there, our tenement is around about 60 kilometers in, uh, in strike and 20 kilometers across. So reasonably healthy sort of parcel of land. Um, we're surrounded by Anglo Gold, Sunrise Dam projects, and uh, to the north we've got Wallaby and Granny Smith uh, Goldfields International. We have 553,000 ounces in gold, as I mentioned, a resource, and our target is adding another million ounces to to the uh, to the project. Our, our early stage 
or the near term project developments will be at, at based along the Fortitude system. We've got Fortitude Gold Mine, which we, we have drilled before. Uh, we've mined a little bit there in the past as well. And then the trend as we head to the north has got a number of projects there and a number of prospects that we'll be drilling out at some stage. And I'll take you through those shortly. We have done mining studies on Fortitude Gold Mine, as, as I mentioned. Uh, I'll come back to that slide right now, actually. So 449, 489,000 ounces in resource there. We have done some optimization. We've done mining studies, which would give us a pit about a kilometre long, one point, uh, 190 metres deep, delivers 132,000 ounces, and at $2,400 an ounce, it um, gives us a, a cash flow or just a surplus cash flow of just under $100 million. Um, one of the key things there is that we've done some trial pit mining, as you can see there in the yellow spots. So we now understand the geology there. We've got some, some data in terms of ground conditions. And more importantly, that, that dirt was trucked to, um, to Sunrise Dam, Anglo Gold's processing facility. So we know it re recovers quite well. The exploration potential is, is quite significant at, uh, at Lake Kerry and really centered along those, those key trends that it's just come up in the black. The, the main fortitude trend is the one that we're, we're working hard on at the moment and takes into, into account all the way from fortitude through FF1 and then all the way up to north towards Granny Smith. Um, all up, that strike extent is around about 94 kilometers of, of um, shear system and mineralization uh, a lot across those three strike those three trends. To the left is the Binder trend. The center one is the Fortitude trend, and then on the west, on the eastern side is the Wilga trend. We've got quite a number of good targets, and we've prioritized those and ranked those according to uh, the stage in the exploration pipeline from early stage through to advanced drilling exploration. Fortitude North is the main one that we're ch we're chasing now, directly north of Fortitude Gold Mine. It's about six kilometers away. We've done uh, some some uh, ground magnetic work on there to help us define or, or, or target, dual target the, uh, the ore system. Um, we have, we have a, a little bit of drilling in there already. And what we're, what we're aiming to do is to do a bit of infield drilling and, and build that up into a resource. So the magnetic data there really assists us in terms of pinpointing and, and, and assisting the, the drill designs going forward. You can see through here, broadly speaking, the, the, um, the magnetic responses are trending almost north-south, a little bit towards the west of north, and they're represented by the, the red zones in there. And the blue zones are the, the, the weaker magnetic responses. And usually, uh, and particularly in Western Australia, what we're chasing is the, the red zones, the high magnetic responses associated with iron, typically uh, so, uh, have sulfides, and that's uh, a perfect fit for gold. A long section along that, what is a bit of a, an exploration model of what we're looking at. It's a gen, essentially a shear hosted system with some high grade plunging shoots. And the drilling certainly at this stage indicates that that's that the models are around about right. Our early stage targeting is we're expecting to find somewhere between about 380 and 350,000 ounces in that spot, or up to even up to 600,000 ounces once we uh, drill, we do extensional drilling. Binder is uh, the uh, the she zone out to the to the west that I mentioned just before. It's been mined by WMC back in the uh, 1980s, a small mine called Binder, and uh, they they essentially mined down to to the uh, the fresh rock. So they took out all the easy stuff, the oxide, and we're we're looking at building on that resource and then exploring further along the the Binder trend out towards the northwest. And you can see there some of the um, some of the drilling completed by Matsa in the last few years, and there's some decent and encouraging intercepts there that uh, that warrant further work. But that's probably uh, the, the second priority in comparison to the fortitude trend. So as I mentioned, we did some some high resolution ground magnetics. We focused that uh, this year on the um, the fortitude structure, the fortitude shear zone, and we've got a number of targets there. FF1. Matsa drilled that and, found, and, and uh, identified some, some anomalous bedrock and oops, bedrock in the, in the air core drilling. 
There's a big bullseye magnetic anomaly directly north of that that has not had any drill drilling into the centre of that sort of system. So that, that provides us with a very encouraging exploration target. And then there's Fortitude North just there. Uh, current work has been centred on that. We've got some air core drilling completed and we're following that up with diamond drilling. Just very quickly, 40 odd thousand metres of um, drilling planned. FF1, this, this is the very first diamond drill hole into that. Um, we got 19 metres of strong to moderate uh, alteration and all the typical mineral assemblages you'd expect to see with gold. So eagerly awaiting the assay results there. Fortitude North, follow up drilling from some of the previous work that we've done. Again, 16 metres of, of um, alteration there as well. That. The other thing in terms of the, this, this second sort of focus for, for MATSA is quietly we'll be building up our, our prospect, our projects in Thailand. We've got tin and lithium exposure on the Western Granite Belt, but our, our, our key focus there as well is, is obviously the Loy Fold Belt in terms of the copper that I mentioned just before. At Pang Na, down the southern part of the, uh, the tin lithium belt on the uh, western side, we've got some sampling, 133 st stream sediment samples with SGS. We expect to get results from that over the course of the next week or two. And as I mentioned, a really strong focus there next to Kingsgate uh, along that Loy Fold belt. You'll see there some of the copper hits that we've had in the past, 54.7% copper for the high grade chalcosite terrific product to be chasing. Timeline of activities, strong focus on Lake Kerry, building the, the picture in the background on, on Thailand, and we expect to, uh, to be able to develop a very good story over the course of the next few months. Thanks very much. Let me get to my 10 second countdown, Pascal. There we go. Dreadnought Resources, come and join us. You're our next presentation up on stage uh, here at Gold Coast Investment Showcase. Dane Tucker, it's actually a wonder you had the time to get here. They're full steam ahead at the moment on a pretty big drilling campaign, which may well deliver, may well deliver a number of nickel, nickel copper and rare earth discoveries across all the projects it has over in WA. Why such a huge program? You're going to let us all know? Why not? Shareholders gave us money to drill, so we're here to drill. Good. Well, Dane Tuck, the stage is yours. Please make him welcome, everyone. Thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here. First time to the Gold Coast, another fantastic conference put on by Vertical Events. Thank you for here in person and those of you who are watching online. Uh, it's it's uh, great to be up here and give another update on Dreadnoughts. It's only a month ago that uh, was last presenting at the conference, but since then we've put out a, a lot of exciting news flow that we've been building up for for the past three years. So very excited to give you guys an update on that. So I'll get this thing majigger working here. Oh, hey, it worked. All right. So Dreadnoughts uh, set, the, set the tone here. We are a West Australian company, so we're a bit foreign to, to Queensland. And we are an exploration company. So we are focused at the moment on the front end of that Lausanne curve. And that is we are taking greenfields exploration projects. We are delivering those first discovery drill holes into targets that we define, and then ultimately delivering those resources so that we can have that full valuation point. When you look at the resource industry in general, some of the biggest and greatest valuation creators is those greenfield discoveries, like you see of Julemar, like you see with De Grey, I guess even Gruyere and Sirius and all of the rest of them lie in town recently. It's really the most exciting thing as an exploration geologist to, to make that discovery and what value that can bring not only to the shareholders, but to the communities and to the states in which we operate. So that's what we are focused on now. Some people ask us, when are you gonna start mining? When are you gonna do developments? What's the goal there? First things first, we need to make the discoveries and deliver those resources. And already in the last six to 12 months, we've already delivered two discoveries uh, just announced one last week on a rare earth, which we just started drilling on, something we only pegged a year ago, right next door to Hastings. So we have a track record of delivering that. I have one of the best teams on the ASX, one of the hardest working teams. Just last week, I was uh, running the samples in from the rare earths from the field, take a, take a shave and a haircut and, and get over here for this conference. The week before that was on the auger program in the Kimberley. And the week before that was delivering a heritage survey, meeting our native title owners at the Mangroon project. So we are very very busy, not a lifestyle company. 84% of our money into the ground. We're very transparent. We put out lots of news flow, everything you want to see from a junior explorer. And most importantly, for the last three years of proving up these targets, uh, we're actually now, we are now delivering our discoveries. 
Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've had a lot of excitement uh, with the rare earths and the nickel at Mangaroon in particular, and some of the hot copper people like to, to keep me in check. And they've asked, oh, what about Alara? Because we started drilling there. And I guess the update on Alara, which I think is a fairly common theme across the industry, is our, our samples are sitting out there in the parking lot at ALS. So this is a, a photo I think would be very common across the industry, across the states, across the country. ALS Labs uh, in WA, they've actually had to hire out the parking lots across the streets for their staff to park in because so many samples are sitting there parked up. So we do have a couple thousand samples. There could be a discovery in there of, of gold or lithium or, or, or we have a resource coming out on Metzke soon. We're waiting for those samples. So we do have some news in the background. Alara is not forgotten. We are waiting for them and uh, they're not even in the system yet. So, and because we keep delivering things like, uh, like our Mangaroon Rare Earths, we rush those samples. You rush a sample, these things don't move. They keep sitting in the parking lot. So inflation's real, even on the assay front of things. So we are, we are still working on Alara. But moving on, Mangaroon has been really outperforming for us lately for the last year. We have a bit of background. We've pegged over 5,000, close to 5,000 square kilometers over some major crustal scale structures right next door to Hastings Yangabana operation, which gave some of the young geos an idea to go look for rare earths. And uh, we also pegged that ground because all the pastoralists in this area had done a lot of work that wasn't in the mines records. And we went out there and we, we tracked some of this work done that was done in the 60s by the pastoralists. One of the guys we work with was born and raised out there. We tracked down the nickel uh, outcropping nickel sulfides, like not something you usually see in WA, nickel sulfides sticking out of the ground. And first quantum came in very quickly on a joint venture with that. We just delivered our first drill program there. And we moved that rig straight down to our rare earths, which this time last year, we announced for the first time that we had outcropping rare earths across the street from, from Hastings. And uh, with, you know, approvals, you know, assays take time, so do approvals and everything else. Like I said, we pegged these ground just over a year ago. We received final approval to drill this project five hours before the earthwork showed up. So it's, uh, you know, we, we stay very busy and, and we, we push things when we're getting things done. So the rare earths, uh, there's a lot of rare earth plays at the moment. There's a lot of, of, of black box mystery and things like that around rare earths. Thankfully for us, we're right across the street from Hastings, who's going to be the next rare earth producer. Uh, for the last 10, 12 years, they've been cracking the code and, and getting this uh, funded, uh, figuring out how to work out the metallurgy and what to do with it. And so we've been able to jump on their shoulders. Uh, it's fantastic to have a giant like that in front of you that you can mimic. And so when we first identified these outcropping rare earths just across the street from Hastings, uh, as you do before you start drilling, Nick and I went out there, grabbed 80 kilos of the stuff, huffed it out and put it through a met flotation test work to show that we can actually produce a monazite. It is the same quality, the same NDPR ratio as Hastings. So we can actually, we know straight up already before we even drilled that we could actually produce a rare earth concentrate that's high demand and high quality. So that's been our work for the last, uh, last year. Leading up to drilling, we put out our first drill hole. Uh, unfortunately, this is this is PXRF results. I hate the fact that we put out PX results, PXRF results. There's no other way to communicate what we had run without getting ourselves into some weird uh, situation where some people would know what we did and other people didn't. So we are rushing these assays. They're at the lab now. We should have them back in the next week or two. Uh, we have pretty high confidence that our, our, birth, our PXRF is operating properly. But regardless, we will have these real results out soon. If these do come in, this is only the first line. To put it into perspective, you know, the best drill intercept that Hastings has put out in 12, 14 years of drilling was 24 meters at 1.8%. Their highest grade was nine meters at 3.3. They have 23, 24 million tons of resources across you know, eight deposits. They did their first blast this month. They are going into production and two of our first six holes have intersected thicker and potentially higher grade mineralization they've hit in 14 years. This is certainly outperformed. When I say the outperformance, uh, this photo down here of Ross Chandler out of ANU, who's been uh, intimately involved, ANU, fantastic university for rare earths. Uh, that's the yin outcrop. You see something like that, it's a big scree hill, there's really nothing sticking out of the ground. And so we had no idea, was this going to be a squibby one meter thing or was it gonna be five to 10 meters was my hope. To get 30 meters coming back on this all the way down section was, was pretty stunning and breathtaking. Uh, there's certainly a bit of champagne popping around sites and, uh, and around the state when we hit that. So it's a very exciting start. The drill rig is drilling. We've had a bit of COVID setback, but we are now uh, going to be drilling that entire two and a half kilometers of strike, wide space 200 by 40, come back and infill 100 by 40. We have Lynn Windebar who did the resource work for Hastings. 
uh, lined up to do the resource work here, pulled them out of retirement, and uh, we'll have resources on this by the, by the end of this year. So very aggressive drilling by our parts, high confidence, great work by our team has allowed us to do this. So we hope to see this continue and we look forward to continually reporting over the next two to three months what we're hitting at Yin. But it's not just Yin that we're drilling, that's just one of the iron stones that we identified early on. We also have Y3, so we'll be doing first pass drilling on that also here in the next two, three months. And then the potential game changer is that C1 to C5 within these carbonatite intrusion complexes on the main structures. You have these ferron carbonatite uh, uh, dikes that shoot out and become these iron stones. It's a late stage rare earth carrier, but you also have plugs. And if these plugs at C1 and C5, which we've identified, which is right on our side of the tenement boundary with Hastings, uh, if those come back mineralized, they can really change the entire scale of this region. And you combine that with Hastings receiving their funding. You have Iluca who just received a billion dollars uh, to develop a rare earth processing plant down at Geraldton, just a few hundred kilometers away. You have Kingfisher doing some fantastic work does set to the south of us in the next major scale structure. And Lanthanide, which is formerly Frontier, also working next to, next to, gas, next to uh, Hastings. This region is really going to develop as a rare earth hub, critical metal hub for the state of Western Australia. And in Exmouth, there's even a proposed uh, zero carbon port to facility by some fantastic people up there. This could become a very, very exciting uh, region over the next couple of months, next couple of years, and we're very excited to be a part of that. But before we drill the rare earths, we also drilled our nickel with first quantum. So I alluded to before we identified uh, some high tenor nickel sulfides at surface, a bit of mapping with first quantum. We identified Gossinus Horizon that runs for 1.2 kilometers long. This Gossinus Horizon set right on the lower contact of the intrusion. It was about 20, 30 centimeters wide. We had a pretty weak small conductor sitting in there. See what that is. Put our first drill holes into it and we hit sort of 10, 12 meters of, of magmatic sulfides. These samples are at the way, on the way to the lab, but what's most encouraging about this to us and to First Quantum, nine, I think nine of our 12 holes all hit mineralization from disseminated through all the way through net textured. We have confirmed that this dike has a funnel shape, so there's a, a place for the sulfides to rain down and form a massive accumulation, potentially. So where in this system have the sulfides accumulated? We've got down holding M crew on site at the moment to get down all these holes to see if we can light something up. And it'll be a matter of drilling deeper and trying to tap this uh, massive sulfide system, which if we do hit it will be very high grade. And all this is funded by First Quantum. So on to Taraji, the Kimberly project, one of our main listing assets. Nick Chapman is in the booth with me today. He's been stuck up there for the last three months. And if you look at his facial hair, he looks like it. Uh, this has been off limits to exploration since 1978. Last year in July, last year we announced our first discovery undercover at Orion. Uh, massive sulfides, 10 to 20 meters thick of coal, copper, cobalt, silver, and gold. And one of the things we had grants nearby, which is historically known prospect. You set those that were within a kilometer, two kilometers of each other. We now have two bodies of mineralization that we can start putting a resource number around. But one of the big things that, uh, that we discovered with that, so it's just a quick slide, some numbers you can't read, but this is our discovery. So with Orion, we have a lot of scale left based on the geophysics to drill this thing deep. So once we finish drilling at Mangaroon, we're taking our RC rig and two diamond rigs up to the Kimberley to chase Orion at depth, start to put some scale on that, put a resource around this and also a grants, which is next door. But one of the big learnings that we had from that drilling was that the cover in the Kimberley was only one to five meters thick, not 30 meters thick like we thought. Surface geochemistry doesn't work on these black plain soils, but with it being only one to five meters thick, we sat down, brought in these guys from Oz X, guy named Gus and, and Jono, absolute legends. And we actually created and built a heli portable auger rig that we were able to get up there during the wet season. And we've now announced our first half of those results. And we looked at Orion. So cover over Orion first. So what would Orion look like if we hit it with an auger rig? We put one hole right on top of one of our best drill intercepts. And we got sort of uh, 0.3 combined copper lead zinc arsenic over 300 by 60 meters. So that gives us an idea of this is what Orion looks like with the auger data. We can now then use that information to assess and see if we can't find other Orion lookalikes using that geochemistry. And the first round we've put out, we've got six or seven targets sitting there. Ironclad, which sits on a major structure, OR4 and OR3 all have uh, existing EM plates sitting under them that we have not drilled yet. Uh, these are really exciting. 
and we have Orion discovery last year. Grants was discovered 1906, and we're the first people to explore. And this year, we get up there drilling again. We'll be finding Orion's friends and making more discoveries and turning this into a new camp. Absolutely exciting development opportunity. And one of the things our shareholders and our board of directors have been dreaming about for a long time. So what does that plan look like? We're a very busy, very active company. We've been spread across all three projects. For the next two, uh, two to three months, we'll be drilling at Mangaroon. That's the rare earth drilling. And then we'll take our rig, add a few diamond rigs and the auger rig back and get up to the Kimberley and do a lot of damage before the wet season. So takeaway messages, we're a very active explorer. We are making discoveries and we promise that we will be delivering resources over the next six to 12 months, starting with the Metzke's gold, then the rare earths, and then everything out of the Kimberley. We're finding the metals for our future. That's rare earth exposure, that's gold exposure, that's copper, cobalt, silver, and gold, all in hand, discoveries made and more discoveries to come and the resources to back it up soon to come, I promise. Thank you very much. Great to hear so positive, Dean. It's been a, you've been busy, busy for a couple of years. Nice to see it finally coming to fruition. Neuroscientific Biopharmaceuticals is a drug development company focused on developing peptide-based pharmaceutical drugs for the treatment of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, and also glaucoma. Now, the nasty conditions and all diseases with high unmet uh, medical needs. So. They've got a lead drug, and I know that those of you who are regulars at this conference will have heard of it before, Empton BTM. Well, it's ready for that initial phase one trial, isn't it, in human beings? Yeah, it's we're on ready. It's just about there. You've got a few approvals. But uh, look, let's welcome Neuroscientific CEO and Managing Director Matt Lidlow to tell us more. Would you please make and welcome everyone? <laughs> Cheers, thanks very much, Chrissy. Um, and it's great to be back here again and actually in the flesh able to mingle with shareholders and 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 potential new investors, I've got to say, uh, after the 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 what we've gone through with the global pandemic. Uh, but just before I uh, get into the core presentation here, I just want to share quickly a message that I received from a shareholder from a few days ago. And this is all uh, got the okay to share this from that shareholder, but Essentially, um, we, we, we do get communication like this from, from patients who have invested in us or, or people with the, with the conditions that we're trying to treat that have actually invested in us in the hope that they will actually uh, invest in a future treatment for themselves. And, uh, and what it does for us is it really sheds light on the human component of, of the research that we do. We spend a lot of time in data and in numbers and tables and graphs and things and, and really looking towards the next outcome that we need to achieve. And, um, and then you get something like this, where it really does humanize the actual, what we are actually doing in the hope that it provides for, for, for sufferers of the conditions that we're trying to tackle. Um, and there's no better way of, uh, or no better ringing endorsement of, of, our, of a company than from um, a shareholder that actually faces the daily challenges of the diseases that we're trying to treat. Um, and where they've decided to put their money um, and hedge their bets in, in what's gonna provide a, a potential solution for them in the future. So moving on to the actual company itself and, and the core presentation. So Neuroscientific Biopharmaceuticals, we're, we're a company developing peptide-based therapeutics that are potent, have potential disease-modifying uh, abilities in certain neurodegenerative conditions. And neurodegeneration uh, involved conditions such as Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, but we also tackle indications that affect the, the optic nerve as well, uh, which are degenerative conditions of the optic nerve. And um, I'll focus more on that bit um, later in the presentation. Uh, we have a lead, a lead compound called Empton B, um, which is quite novel, but well developed and based on fantastic foundational science. And most excitingly for us, as Chrissy mentioned, we're actually transitioning to the clinical phase after a long period of getting the robust preclinical stuff done. We're imminently about to start our first clinical trial. From a corporate perspective, we listed on the stock exchange in July 2018. Uh, we're currently well funded with 7.3 million in the, um, of cash on hand. The board and management team is a really good mix of technical capabilities as well as capital markets experience. Uh, and with a market cap of $25 million and the news flow that we've actually got coming up, um, which is quite historic for the company, we're actually very good value at current share price. Uh, 
uh, for exactly for where we're currently positioned. And the company itself, we, we, we operate in um, a number of different markets in neurodegenerative that cover neurodegeneration. And that includes Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common form of dementia, multiple sclerosis, another neurodegenerative condition, but that is diagnosed in people from a younger age and has a, a progression, uh, a long, much longer progression throughout the life of that patient. And the third one there is uh, optic neuropathies, but really the lead indication there is glaucoma, which is the leading cause of, of damage to um, irreversible blindness through damage to the optic nerve, which is the nerve that you know, connects the eye to the brain and all the visual, takes the visual information that you see to the brain. The underlying, uh, the fundamental problem with neurodegeneration and, and where there's a dearth of treatment options and things to address these under medical needs is the lack of, well, the gaps in the knowledge base about what's the actual cause of, um, of the disease or the condition itself. And the way that we're addressing that is we've actually, uh, our lead compound is just based on harnessing the natural protective mechanisms of the body based on a protein that is naturally produced by the body, uh, quite a complex protein, and it's part of the immune, innate immune response. We've just sort of amplified that response and have a bit more control over it uh, by developing a, a, a druggable compound um, that follows the same processes of that complex compound. So our lead product, our lead drug candidate is called Empton B. It's in and of itself, it's a peptide based product, but it's quite complex. And it is based on one functional unit of a humanized protein uh, called metallothionine 2, uh, which has a large body of evidence that sits behind it uh, and, and basically well studied over a 40 year period as a protective protein in the body of various tissues around the body. Our focus is largely on nerve tissue. And the way our drug works is it attaches to a particular receptor on the outside of cells to turn on mechanisms within the cell that, uh, that, that, that pathways that related to cell survival, regeneration, and also reduction in inflammation when, it, when that, target is, that target receptor is expressed on immune cells. So turning to what that means from a therapeutic uh, side of things or how it actually works uh, and what we've seen in animal models of disease. If we look at our results from the gold standard model of Alzheimer's disease, you can see there we've achieved a very significant in, um, increase in, um, in memory improvement, if you like. So prevented cognitive decline, but really improvement in memory in layman's terms. Uh, which is the key goal with Alzheimer's disease is, is improvement of memory and improvement of cognition. But we also had a marked effect on dampening the inflammation that's associated with, with, with Alzheimer's disease as well. And turning to multiple sclerosis, uh, we've done a lot of work examining the different pathways that we can mitigate and actually have an effect on to uh, modify the course of the disease over a period of time. And there's multiple aspects. There's a lot of data on this slide, but in a nutshell, what we're trying to show here is that not only in model sclerosis do we have an effect on the increasing the survival and the regeneration of nerve cells, but we've been able to establish the effect we have on also what production of what's called myelin, and that's the sheath that actually protects um, the processes, the signaling process of these cells. And it's one of the one of the main main fundamental causes of of um, disability in, in multiple sclerosis starts with the breakdown and destruction of the myelin um, protein in itself. And so we've, we've been able to demonstrate in multiple different models that we can mitigate that. And the other component, which is also important with multiple sclerosis in and of itself is the effect that we have on actually reducing inflammation. And we've done that across multiple different, um, different, different biomarkers being measured there to show that the effect is not just related to one, one pathway there, it's a couple of different pathways. That are affected uh, that um, really um, brings down right down to a normalized level um, the actual start of the peripheral information and then what happens up in the brain later on in the course of the disease and then looking at the effect that we can have in glaucoma and the effect that glaucoma has on the optic nerve um, and this one does deserve a little bit of an explanation here um, and this is in an increased pressure model a pig model where they just it's basically the, the ocular pressure in the eye is lifted to a quite extreme um, 
uh, measure and that quite quickly then starts to cause that damage to the back of the eye and affects the optic nerve. And you can see with the treated cells, uh, treated uh, eyes with Empton B, nice structure formation still retained in, that, in the optic nerve sections. And then when you're looking at the non-treated, not so much. You can see they've been obliterated by that pressure. So from a development overview, we're very busy with what we've got going on. Um, we, you know, we, we, there's a lot more we could do too, but we've obviously limited resources. We have to focus our attention in certain areas. We have R&D programs happening in neurology, which are the two main indications of Alzheimer's disease and multiple sclerosis. And that's the program that we're transitioning in imminently into clinical trials. Then we have our work that we do in ophthalmology and not far behind uh, that the neurology program as far as clinical, clinical development sits our, our, our ophthalmology program. We also do some foundational studies and exploratory uh, type indications where we're really trying to understand uh, different effects of how Empton B works uh, in diseases that are not related to nerve tissue. We, when we do our research, we don't have wet labs or anything like that. We actually partner with the best in the world to get our work done, and that involves companies in Australia and overseas. For our clinical program, uh, our initial studies will all be done in Perth, WA, where, we are, where we're based, um, we, via uh, Linear, the contract research organisation Linear. A little bit more colour on what that looks like as far as our, our, our clinical development program. We're actually doing initially an early phase, what's called an early phase clinical trial. And that will then, in parallel, we will start a phase one, a big phase one clinical trial as well. And the reason for that is we, we, with the early phase clinical trials, really focusing on looking at the mode of action of Empton B in humans prior to um, going into larger later phase clinical trials so that we can really get a measure on, on how the drug works in target engagement and the mode of action. And then when we go into those later phase clinical trials, the phase two and beyond when we're testing in patients, uh, we've got really good knowledge around how the, um, the, the drug is actually, you know, the potency that we need to use to have an effect uh, and um, it's, it's, it's just really supportive of the actual efficacy that we expect to see. The phase one study in and of itself is actually a very large phase one study and that will incorporate a large range of, of, of doses. And again, just explaining the reason for that is because we wanna be able to repurpose that phase one data against multiple different phase two studies. Uh, so we will not, you know, basically it will support, we won't have to repeat phase one clinical trials demonstrating that safety again, we'll have it across quite a large dose range and get the coverage that we need to then take it into. It can support Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis studies and whatever neurodegenerative indication from that that we want to actually tackle later on. And finally, looking at what we, where we've been, what we've done and where we expect to go in the future with our pivotal milestones, uh, what we've completed over the last couple of years, uh, including our safety and toxicity studies in animals to show um, the basically across two different species, then Empton B is a very safe product to use and it ticks all the goal, all, all the boxes from a regulatory perspective. We've also done this pre very robust preclinical biomarker program. And as I just explained, really to identify mechanism of action um, and, and, and efficacy biomarkers related to that we can then, you know, we've taken it into uh, the, the human part of that imminently, but then really useful service purpose in phase two and beyond. We've been able to manufacture clinical grade Empton Beak very successfully and scale the process so that we show them that it's feasible to actually commercialize it. And we achieved our first HAREC approval just recently, which is the ethics approval to actually be able to undertake a clinical trial in Australia. And for near term key milestones, uh, we'll commence that early phase trial, clinical trial very soon. We'll get, we have another HAREC approval that we expect to get in, uh, for the phase one study very soon as well. We'll start announcing things such as the cohort um, recruitment phases for those studies being completed or the first cohort. Uh, and we've also, um, I'm currently in the, in the thick of undertaking quite a large preclinical program for multiple sclerosis in, in two of the gold standard animal models. And we just recently released some preliminary results from that um, the last few weeks ago. But um, we will have a full set of results 
in the second half of this year to support our more more data to support um, the the model sclerosis program and more understanding for us on on exactly dose levels and and uh, what those inflammatory markers look like within that disease as well. So that wraps it up, and I thank you very much. Last presentation before your lunch break. So um, thanks for hanging around, and um, if you need to chat, we're out in the foyer, or if there's any questions you'd like to ask, please do. Thank you, Chrissy. Thanks, Matt. Well, that was an interesting. And I like your first comment too, that the, the um, feedback you got from the investor too. I think we all like to get to a level about investing and making money. Nice though to be able to get to a point where we've got enough money that we can choose to invest in something that will change other people's lives for the good as well, not just our bank balances. Go and enjoy lunch. We've got a short session after lunch today, only an hour and a half long. So we'll see you back there. We'll hear the big bell and come on in. <laughs>